J.G. Ballard, The Catastrophist. Review of the complete stories of J.G. Ballard. The Atlantic, January, February, 2010. In the spring of 2006, at the Hay on Wye Book Festival, I was introduced at dinner to Sir Martin Rees, who is the Professor of Cosmology and Astrophysics at Cambridge University and also holds the pleasingly archaic title of Astronomer Royal. He was to give a lecture that was later reprinted with the title Dark Materials in honour of the late Professor Joseph Rotblat. In the course of this astonishing talk, he voiced the following thought. Most educated people are aware that we are the outcome of nearly four billion years of Darwinian selection, but many tend to think that humans are somehow the culmination. Our sun, however, is less than halfway through its lifespan. It will not be humans who watch the sun's demise six billion years from now. Any creatures that then exist will be as different from us as we are from bacteria or amoebae. Among the several questions that jostled for the uppermost in my mind was this. Where is the fiction that can rise to the level of this stupefying reality? Only one novelist, Julian Barnes, was sufficiently struck to include Rees's passage in a book, but that was in his extended non-fiction memoir about death, nothing to be frightened of. I quite soon came to realise that there was indeed a writer who could have heard or read those words with equanimity, even satisfaction and that this was J.G. Ballard. For him, the possibility of any mutation or metamorphosis was to be taken for granted, if not indeed welcomed. As was the contingency, the dead sun or no dead sun, the terrestrial globe could very readily be imagined after we're gone. As one who has always disliked and distrusted so-called science fiction, the votaries of this cult disagreeing pointlessly about whether to refer to it as SF or sci-fi, I was prepared to be unimpressed even after Kingsley Amis praised Ballard as the most imaginative of H.G. Wells' successors. The natural universe is far too complex and frightening and impressive on its own to require the puerile add-ons of space aliens and superweapons. The interplanetary genre made even C.S. Lewis write more falsely than he normally did. Hearing me drone on in this vein about 30 years ago, Amis Fees who contributes a highly lucid introduction to this collection, wordlessly handed me The Drowned World, The Day of Forever, and for a shift in pace and rhythm, Crash. Any one of these would have done the trick. For all that, Ballard is arguably best known to a wide audience because of his relatively straight novel Empire of the Sun and the resulting movie by Steven Spielberg. Some of his devotees were depressed by the literalness of the subject matter, which is a quasi-autobiographical account of being 13 years old and an inmate in a Japanese internment camp in Shanghai. It's not possible to read that book, however, and fail to see the germinal effect that experience had on Ballard the man. To see a once thriving city reduced to beggary and emptiness, to live one day at a time in point of food and medicine, to see an old European order brutally and efficiently overturned, to notice the utterly casual way in which human life can be snuffed out, and to see war machines wheeling and diving in the overcast sky. Such an education. Don't forget either that young Ballard was ecstatic at the news of the atomic obliteration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, an emotion that makes him practically unique among post-war literati. Included in this collection is a very strong 1977 story, The Dead Time, a sort of curtain-raiser to Empire, Ballard's own preferred name for his book, in which a young man released from Japanese captivity drives a truckload of cadavers across a stricken landscape and ends up feeding a scrap of his own torn flesh to a ravenous child. Readers of Ballard's memoir Miracles of Life, a book with a slightly but not entirely misleading title, will soon enough discern that he built on his wartime Shanghai traumas in three related ways. As a teenager in post-war England, he came across first Freud and second the Surrealists. He describes the two encounters as devastating, in that they taught him what he already knew. Religion is abject nonsense, human beings positively enjoy inflicting cruelty, and our species is prone to and can coexist with the most grotesque absurdities. What could have been more natural, then, 
than that Ballard the student should devote himself to classes in anatomy, spending quality time with corpses, some of whom in life had been dedicated professors in the department. An astonishing number of his shorter works followed the inspiration of Crash, also filmed, this time by David Cronenberg, in morbid and almost loving accounts of wound profiles, gashes, fractures, and other inflictions on the flesh and bones. Fascinated by the possibility of death in traffic, and rather riveted by the murder of John Kennedy, Ballard produced a theme series titled The Atrocity Exhibition, here partially collected, where collisions and ejaculations and celebrities are brought together in a vigorously stirred mix of Eros and Thanatos. His antic use of this never-failing formula got him briefly disowned by his American publisher and was claimed by Ballard as pornographic science fiction. But if you can read The Assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy Considered as a Downhill Motor Race or Why I Want to Fuck Ronald Reagan in Search of Sexual Gratification, you must be jaded by disorders undreamed of by this reviewer. Both stories, however, succeed in being deadpan funny. Another early story, though not represented here, the claim of this volume to be complete is somewhat deceptive. In something of the same style, plan for the assassination of Jacqueline Kennedy, ignited a ridiculous fuss in the very news rags whose ghoulish coverage of her life Ballard was intending to satirise. Randolph Churchill led the charge, demanding punishment for the tiny magazine that printed it. This modest proposal furnishes one of many clues to a spring of Ballard's inspiration, which is fairly obviously the work of Jonathan Swift. In 1964, he even wrote an ultra-macabre story, The Drowned Giant, which tells of what happens when the corpse of a beautiful but gigantic man washes ashore on a beach five miles to the northwest of the city. The local Lilliputians find cheap but inventive ways of desecrating and disfiguring the body before cutting it up for souvenirs and finally rendering it down in big vats. One might characterize this as the microcosmically ideal Ballard fantasy in that it partakes of the surreal, the Gulliver being represented as a huge flesh statue based on the work of Praxiteles, as well as of the Freudian, as if the mutilation of this motionless colossus had released a sudden flood of repressed spite. In the pattern of many other stories, the narrator adopts the tone of a pathologist, dictating a detached report of gross anatomy. A single phrase, colossal wreck, is a borrowing from Shelley's Osamandius, which may be the closest that Ballard ever came to a concession to the Romantic school. Another and nearer literary source is provided by the name Traven, of the solitary character in the terminal beach. This is one of two tales, the other being One Afternoon at Utah Beach, in which Ballard makes an imaginarium out of the ruined scapes of World War II. Like his modern but vacant cities full of ghostly tower blocks, he is obsessed with towers of all sorts and abandoned swimming pools, the Pacific and Atlantic beaches, still covered by concrete blocks and bunkers, furnish the ideal setting for a Ballardian wasteland. The beach in the first story has the additional advantage of having been the site of an annihilating nuclear test. The revenant shapes of long-dead Japanese and Germans are allowed a pitiless flicker before their extinction. Ballard is not the most quotable of authors because he takes quite a long time to set a scene and because his use of dialogue is more efficient than it is anything else, but he can produce arresting phrases and images. He is especially observant about eyes. On succeeding pages of the cloud sculptors of Coral D, we find that memories, caravels without sails, cross the shadowy deserts of her burned-out eyes, and that the dwarf, Petit Manuel, regards this same woman with eyes like crushed flowers. This entire story is infused with an eerie beauty as the wings of gliders carve marvels out of the cumulus and one aesthetic pilot soared round the cloud, cutting away its tissues. The soft fleece fell toward us in a cool rain. The cruel, capricious beauty who becomes the wealthy patron of this art is careless of the human cost it may entail. In her face, the diagram of bones formed a geometry of murder. Ballard wrote his heart out, especially after the random death of his beloved wife left him to raise three children, so I don't especially like to say that he wrote too much. This book has almost 1,200 pages. 
but some of the stories are in want of polish and finish. In the last world of Mr. Goddard, a department store supervisor keeps a microcosm of his town, complete with live-action human figures, in a box in his safe at home. Each evening, he can watch what everybody is doing and use the knowledge the next day. At first, I was surprised that he never exploited this advantage to observe anybody having sex. And then I noticed that Ballard had oddly deprived his minutely supervised miniatures of the power to be overheard, so that Mr. Goddard actually had no idea what was going on. Like a movie that is only part talky, this scenario is leached of its initial power. In compensation, several of the stories are pure jeu d'esprit, where the charm of the conceit hardly requires any suggestion of the sinister or the doomed. Despite the menacing title of Prima Bella Donna, the first of the collection, one is immediately bewitched by the very idea of a flower shop where the gorgeously different blooms are all live stand-ins for musicians and opera singers, such as a delicate soprano mimosa, and where the owner of this hard-to-manage chloro-florist establishment eventually confronts an audio-vegetative Armageddon. If this innocuous environment could not deflect Ballard from his insistence on apocalypse in familiar surroundings, it is hardly startling to find that his penultimate tale is titled The Secret Autobiography of J.G.B. For most of his life, our great specialist in catastrophe made his home in the almost laughably tranquil London suburb of Shepparton, the sheltered home of the British movie studios. He obviously relished the idea of waking one day to find himself the only human being on the planet, to explore a deserted London and cross a traffic-free Thames, to pillage gas stations and supermarkets, and then to drive contentedly home. B was ready to begin his true work. <laughs>